Hello everyone, George here, and we're starting with chapter one of the Ray Tracer Challenge. In this chapter, we're going to set up a class called the Tuple, which is going to become the parent class for two other classes that we're probably more familiar with. That is the Vector class and the Point class. Tuple contains four different values, X, Y, Z coordinate, and a W coordinate. The W coordinate is important because it's going to differentiate between a vector value and a point value. So in this case, we create the child class point. However, I'm going to notice very quickly that I get errors, and this happens to be because C-sharp already has a class called tuple, so I need to wrap this in its own namespace. You'll also notice that tuple is abstract, meaning that I will not be able to actually instantiate tuple. It's just meant to provide some filler information for the point in the vector class that are common to both of those, basically the values and a few operations that we get later on. There we go. I go ahead and wrap these things in the namespace RT, which stands for ray trace. And uh, once I get those set up, it's now time to create our constructors. So the, the default constructor is created right there for the tuple class. The point class is going to have a W value automatically set to 1.0, and the vector class is going to have one where it's set automatically to 0.0 for us. Now here, I give you the option of setting the W coordinate. I'm actually going to take that option away in just a few seconds, and W is going to be hard-coded to be 1.0. Takes me a second to remember how to call the base class, but uh, I eventually get through it and make it work. There's the vector class being implemented, very similar to the point class. The only difference, of course, is that final value being 1. Technically, you could just make the tuple class, not make it abstract, and then always know that you're supposed to set one to one and the other to zero, or you could create a, a method that does that for you. I just decided to create two separate classes because things like the cross product only work on vectors, and I didn't want points to get in that kind of mess. Here I'm creating the unit tests for testing everything. There's going to be a lot of unit testing in this, as the book recommends. I don't know Cucumber and some of these other programs for unit testing, so I'm just going to create methods inside of the main part of it that are static, which I'll call and spit out all the information that I actually need. Now to make my life easier, I go ahead and implement the override for toString in the tuple class, therefore point and, and vector get it as well, just to make my life easy when printing out all this information. There we go, I go ahead and add those two unit tests to the main part of it, make sure they're static, print it out, everything looks good. I format it a little bit differently just to make sure everything looks nice, and we move on to the next part, which are the operators, which is pretty much most of the rest of the video. The first operator we're going to handle is addition, and it does take me a little bit of time to figure out how I want addition to work within the context of the tuple as a parent class and vector as point. I want it to automatically return the correct type. That is, if I'm adding a vector and a point, it should return a point. If I'm adding two vectors, it should return a vector, and vice versa and so forth. So to make sure that works, at first I think, okay, can I just have a vector type and it, and it takes in two tuples? And none of this really works. And I have to say, you know, I, I kind of waste 15 minutes trying to, in my head, figure out how this whole thing works. I even go to the tuple class and like, okay, if I just return a base type of tuple and I take in two tuples, that's kind of universal, right? But I don't want that. I want it to automatically know when to return a vector and when to return a point. I'm being kind of picky here, Technically, everything could be that tuple class, but you know what? I'm going down this road, so I might as well make it work. Eventually, I get it in my head after several sort of retypes. I'm not really thinking. I'm just kind of coding on the fly, seeing what works and what doesn't as I'm doing this. And in this case, I finally figure out that I just need to make three different overloads for the addition operator. Uh, one that's going to be of type vector, return a vector, and then two that return type point. And it's going to be a vector that, that takes in two vectors and returns a vector. And whenever I have a point, I just need to make sure that I return a point instead. Now, I do mess things up, and that is I make it ambiguous with my overloads. That is, I put the same thing in both the point and the vector class. And in a few seconds, when I try to implement this, it's going to give me a red squiggle indicating an error after I create these points and vectors to use for my unit testing. And it's going to say, hey, it's ambiguous. I don't know which of these methods to actually call. So I go ahead and delete the ones that make it ambiguous, and I fill out every case. I check to make sure my values make sense. Everything looks good. And now I go ahead and I take a look at my vector class, and I realize I really shouldn't have things that return points in my vector class, so I'm going to go ahead and move them over to the point class. Now I'm going to implement the subtraction operator, which is pretty much just a copy and paste of the addition operator, Instead, with the pluses changed to minuses. Here I'm doing my unit test for that. Everything works out just fine. And we're going to go ahead and move on to the negation operator. So with negation, that's just a unary operator with a minus sign in front of the vector or the point. And because it still will return a vector 
a point or a vector that is it does differentiate between the two i have to implement each one in the child classes as opposed to implementing in the tuple class instead because otherwise i'd be returning a tuple which it doesn't make any sense for what i'm doing I, you can't return you don't have types of tuple in what i'm doing you only have points and vectors so there we go i'm testing out the negation of them uh, everything looks like it works just fine I go ahead and try it. I tried to do it in a tuple class, but it didn't work at all. And, uh, doing one final test, making sure it works. All the values get negated. Everything works just fine. Now we get to move on to the scalar multiplication operator, which I do two of. I do one where I take in its multiplication of a vector times a float, and I also do a point times a float. But I also add the scale value if I don't want to return a new vector or point, but instead just want to augment or modify the particular value that I'm dealing with. So here you can see those two different methods right there that I'm dealing with. And we're going to go over and create a unit test to test all those different things out. We create a point, a vector, and then we do multiplication, scalar multiplication. And then I'm also going to create the, uh, the two that implement scale methods so that that value itself gets scaled and we're not actually returning a new vector or a point as well. Next up is magnitude, which is just Pythagorean's theorem. Interesting thing here is that magnitude is handled using the W coordinate, which I don't initially do. Uh, I make it a tuple. Technically, uh, I also have to deal with the fact that all the mathematics stuff is of type double and not float, so I have to typecast everything over to make sure that works, but everything's fine there. I also implement something that's not in the book, and that's the square magnitude method, because if you don't need to do that square root, you can save yourself a lot of hassle. One, I can not have to typecast, and two, I don't have to do a square root, so things will be a lot faster. So that works out just fine. And then we go ahead and we're going to move on next to the normalized method. I'm going to make two different methods, normalized and normalized. Normalized actually uh, normalizes the, the vector itself that I'm dealing with and returns it. Normalize, on the other hand, is going to normalize the vector I'm dealing with. So you can see I return a vector in both cases. Normalized will return a new vector. Normalized will modify the vector that I'm handling. I'm creating a unit test now of that to make sure everything works. And I also go ahead and start testing some of the more interesting stuff uh, in a few seconds. I'm going to deal with the dot product now. Dot product is really simple. It's the same for both a point and a vector. So I can implement that as a tuple object instead because it just returns a scalar value. And I don't need to worry about points or vectors in this case. Do a dot product of these two values because they're on opposite. I'm going to normalize them basically because dot product is a lot easier to understand and test when your values are between, uh, the magnitudes are between or the unit vectors instead. So now I can test to see whether or not they're, they're opposites, which are gonna be a negative one value, or they're the same, which is gonna be a positive value, or they're 90 degrees offset to each other, in which case I'll get a value of zero. Okay, now that we've done that, it's time for the cross product. And this is where the, the entire reason why I wanted to separate the vector and the point class, because the point has no cross product. I mean, you can't have a cross product, it's just very complicated because of that W coordinate, but a three dimensional, cross product is very easy to deal with. You can see me implementing that there, trying to remember the actual uh, formula. I'm trying not to actually look at the book for the, uh, the formulas for this stuff. I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head. Here we do a cross product of a vector X and Y, and we should be getting a Z value. And I flop, uh, flip flop those two values, so I should be getting a negative Z value as well. That works just fine. Now we're off to creating the challenge of the chapter, which is creating a projectile and an environment class. The projectile is going to have a position and a velocity, and we're going to update that through tick, a tick method, and it's going to update all the way to either the projectile reaches a value of zero, or I create a integer that counts how many iterations we do, and if we end up with an infinite loop, it'll eventually cancel out, so I don't have to worry about the program executing for infinity. Here we have a utility class. I forgot to implement float equality, where we have an epsilon value, and basically two float values are going to be the same, so long as the difference between those values is incredibly small. In this case, smaller than 0 0.0001 as a floating point value. Now we go ahead and I implement the equality operator using the float equality. And you notice I changed the name from float equality to FE to make things a little bit shorter. This way I can now compare tuples, which are points or vectors, to each other very easily. Now we create the unit test for equality to make sure that entire thing works. Here I create some very small differences between the two and see whether or not they are the same or different. Here it's one unit higher than what it is. I'm gonna go in there and actually make it one unit smaller in a second, make it one five, and they are actually evaluated to true. Now it's time for us to go ahead and finish everything with projectile and environment. The environment contains a gravity and a wind element. The environment here it takes in the gravity and wind values, and then we're going to use that to continually change how the projectile moves throughout the environment. 
Now we have our tick. It's going to take the position and modify it by the velocity, and it's going to have its velocity, which is then modified by the velocities inside of the environment. Next up, we create a method called run simulation, which is going to have our infinite loop, or I should say semi-infinite, infinite in the sense that it continues until the thing hits the ground or we hit a certain number of iterations. So we have our projectile, our environment, now is our while loop, so long as our position is greater than 0.0, .0 continue to tick through it and update it. And then we're going to write out our simulation results, which also requires that I override the two string method in the projectile and environment class, once again, just to make my life easier whenever I need to spit stuff out to the console. There you can see the two different ones. Now is where I add that max iteration and I make it 60, what is that, 600,000. I actually screw up and you'll notice I put a or symbol in there instead, which is causing it to continue to, to run all the way up to the value of 600,000. After not understanding what the heck I'm doing, I finally take a minute and look at my logic and any second now I'm gonna click that or and I'm gonna add two ands, ampersands instead for an and instead, which will make everything work just fine. Here I add a little debugging to make sure that if I hit the maximum number, it will automatically cancel everything and, and uh, print out that, hey, I've hit the max number. Just little things. It's nice sometimes to uh, add those little things when things break. All right, everyone, that's pretty much it for Ray Tracer chapter one. Took about two hours for me to get through, but it was very late at night, so I think I was just tired. Next up is chapter two, where we tackle creating our own canvas. And hopefully, soon after that, we'll start drawing our own graphics to the screen. Thank you all for watching. If you're following along, feel free to comment below about where you are in the entire series. And I will see you next time. So long. Goodbye.